Uh, good morning, everybody. This is coffee hour number 133. My name is John Kelsey. I'm the moderator of Lancaster Woodturners Weekly Coffee Hour. Welcome aboard. We have uh, 36 on screen right now. It'll probably float up a few more as we get into the hour. Uh, and we'll be here for an hour, as we always are. Uh, the next event for Lancaster Woodturners is a week Saturday, another open shop here at Kaufman Kitchens. Uh, you're welcome to attend if you want to learn something and you also if you want to teach something. And if there's something you'd like to know about, uh, let somebody on the executive know about it so we can try and mobilize somebody to come and show you. Um, it's We've got four ladies here. Last time we had as many experts as beginners. It was a very rich session for those who were here. So I'm encouraging anybody in the Lancaster area uh, who can get here on Saturday the 14th to uh, at, from 9 to noon to please come on aboard. Uh, this is a show and tell coffee hour. I'm here with Peter Caddick. Peter's uh, working with me on the audio video setup for our club. Uh, so we're, we've been doing a bunch of experimenting and you know, it's like that. Uh, last week I grabbed the first show and tell spot and I'm going to do the same this week because I'm going to continue with the conversation about magnet boxes for a minute or two. Uh, I wanted to show you some of the experiment. Last week I showed you this one here. This is a two this is a magnet box that has a little pillar in the middle. So the magnet goes on like that. It's very tight. I can open it, I a compartment there. Where am I gonna put this so it shows best? Okay, that's good. And I can open it so there's a compartment there. I can turn it over. It has a top and a bottom, it's rosewood. Okay, my struggle is uh, the magnet's in the way, but that at least the box works. I wanted to show you a couple of older ones. A few years ago, I made a lot of these. Uh, these have magnets embedded in the wood and, the, and I made a lot of them that are like this one. This one, the, the, the lid is on here, so the grain is lined up appropriately. If I try and put it on wrong, it spits it off. It won't like that. It just won't do it. Because there's magnets of opposite polarity in the wood that reject the lid if you try and put it on cross grain. So that's an attempt to control the user from afar using magnets, the uh, power of the universe. Uh, as I think I've explained to you before, boxes like this are made with a a, a three-part blank. Uh, there's a piece there, and there's a piece there, and there's a middle piece. The middle piece is the one you want. So what you do is you got to make these three discs with dead flat surfaces. Then you take the middle piece and drill it from both sides and install the magnets with whatever polarity you want. Then you glue the whole ba thing back together into a log and part off in between the magnets in the middle piece. So now you have half of the middle piece attached to the base piece with magnets embedded in the wood. And you don't see the glue line because it's here in this lovely detail. And the same thing in the lid. You have magnets buried in the lid. You don't see them. Uh, they're, they're, they're hidden in that glue line, that glue line. Uh, and I don't even remember if there are four or six or eight of them in here, but I know that you can't put the lid on this box crossways. It has to go on with the grain lined up. On the other hand, the trouble with that is it makes a hell of a lot of box. I mean, these are half an inch, five eighths of an inch thick. You cannot get away from having a lot of bulk when you're hiding magnets in the wood. Um, I put a lot of attention into trying to get away from that. And I made, uh, and this is the best one I made in that whole series a couple of years ago. This is from the baseball series. Um, <clears throat> this is an ash box. Uh, and the inside is the cross section of a baseball, of course. It has a cork in the middle and it has the colors of the rubber and pear wood and that looks like string so uh, and the box is ash and the grain is strong enough so you if you look close you can see the discontinuities continuities where the glue lines are but the thing is that's a minimum condition i couldn't get the side walls here any smaller than this and i've made oh dozens of these and uh, probably a half of them get rejected and the reason they get rejected is you don't quite know where those damn magnets are and uh, you get in there and you're right down in here trying to make this fit just the way you want it. It's a loose fit, not a tight fit. Uh, and you turn right into the magnets and suddenly you hear the click on the tool. And I can see one like just one wood cell below the surface over there. So I, I just managed to save this box. So that's been my story with magnet boxes. And I put it aside for a few years until a couple of weeks ago. Doug and I got talking and he wants a box to put his sanding discs in. And we were talking about this last week. So I made a prototype. This one has the magnets are over here in these ears. Uh, so I made a box that has four compartments. It was like just a proof of concept. Uh, each each compartment's oh, almost half an inch deep. Lid goes on, lid goes on. So you can have four or five kinds of sandpaper discs in here. You can lift it apart or you can turn them to open it. Uh, okay, what went wrong? Well, 
magnets are in the side wing here. So I wanted it to be wood here, but it's you see the magnet there. And the reason I don't like to see the magnet is they collect schmutz. Uh, any bit of iron filing that gets around is going to stick to that magnet and it starts to look grimy pretty quick. Uh, that might be a, what you have to live with for these things. I don't know. But anyway, I made this thing as a proof of concept. Each of these pieces is the same in cross section. It has an innie and an outie. So this is the box part and this is its lid part. It closes down tight and all that. What I didn't do, of course, was measure any three inch sand at this before I made it. I said, oh, they're three inches. So I'll make this all oh, about three and an eighth. Well, most three inch sanded discs are three and a quarter, it turns out, as I discovered after I'd made the box. So <laughs> measure twice, cut once is what they say. So that's where I got to with this. Now, having gotten this far, Doug loves it. So I'm going to try and make him one properly to hold sanding discs. And I'm going to do that in order to prove out the concept to develop the jigs, because you really need jigs to do this. You, these, these little magnet ears, you turn it as a cylinder, uh, you bore it for the magnet, and then you got to glue it on here. Well, how do you get the curve? Well, I used a spindle sander with a three-inch drum on it, and it worked fine. Uh, but somehow you got to do that. So it needs, and then once you've done that, of course, you got to glue them on. So how do I glue these two on here? Well, I just did it with a clamp. But if I was going to do this anymore, I would need to make an assembly jig so I can hold this in place and clamp that on there and make it work. So that's my next endeavor. I'm going to make Doug a sandpaper disc box that actually works. And in that process, develop the jigs to make some really nice jewelry boxes and pill boxes that are just a little bit smaller than this. This is too big for that. Get them back down to towards this size. And, you know, and then the question is, if the box is this big and it's got magnet ears, how big are the magnet ears so it'll look good? Um, and when does it start looking like Mickey Mouse? And do you want one, two, three, or just one, two? So there's a lot of choices in design and working it out, but that's where I'm at with the magnet box thing. So having said all that, um, any comments or questions? Let me take the spotlight off me so we can get a gallery view here. How do I do that? I, I did it for you, John. You did it for me. Thank you, Jim. Yeah. The upper left corner should show remove spotlight. Ah. So. Okay, we got it. So that's my that's my show and tell. Any comments or questions? Uh, John, one yeah. of the things that I've done that I saw once was a jewelry box uh, that had a uh, I guess I call it a rod or a pin, and it would spin around that rod and around the base, and uh, it it was for jewelry, uh, but the individual slices, I guess you'd call it, had a pin that stuck down. So you could only open it up the whole way. And then it would grab the next pin down. And if you kept opening it, you'd all eventually have four, uh, like a clover leaf. I think I'd like to see that. That sounds like a good idea. Anybody else fool around with these ma with magnets and boxes and things? Anybody else got any comments on this? Might be easier to thread a box if you just want something that'll hold on good. <laughs> uh, well, you if you knew how many boxes I'd screwed up trying to learn how to thread a box, you, you might change your mind on that. <laughs> the, the, the thing the thing that I with this magnet thing that John is doing, I understand what you're saying about threading it, but when you're in the shop and you're trying to get another piece of sandpaper, you don't want to be twisting things off and twisting them on. So that idea with a ma magnet so it can stack easily yeah. was the one I was really going for. And then you can turn it off and easily move it from one side to the other. It doesn't take a multi-hand yeah. well, thing. Doug, in that regard, in order to be real useful in the shop, should it not also have some magnets in the base so it'll stick to your lathe ways? Um, it would be helpful, but the, uh, the, it wouldn't be the first thing I thought of, put it that way. Well, but yeah, it runs into another thing, you know, I, I have a robust lathe and the lathe ways are stainless steel. Magnets don't stick to it. Uh, Barry didn't buy a robust because most of his jigs use magnets to stick to the lathe ways. So he has to have a lathe that has steel that will ex listen yeah, to a magnet. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> The other thing I learned about magnets that people generally don't know is that from a magnet's point of view, wood and air are the same. So if you have yeah, a magnet yeah. buried in the wood or if you just have one with space around it, 
it's the the magnet doesn't care it it attracts with the exact same strength whether there's a piece of wood in between the two parts or not so i thought that was pretty interesting to learn too it is interesting john on your original the fat one you showed us your original one from a long time ago you talked about cutting it apart finally with a parting tool oh. so your magnets are sitting down so you're not hitting them when you hit it with the parting tool right right they're okay. in a known distance from each surface, and I know how much extra space I have to work both to work with and to make the interlocking parts of the flange and the fit of the lid. Now, these are not tight fitting lids. A tight fitting lid goes to war with your magnets right away. This wants to be a loose fitting lid that spins right around. I have quite a few of these or several of these I was looking this morning. Um, I thought I was a loose fit, but the box has been sitting around for a couple of years. Not a loose fit anymore. It, uh, it, the, the grain is, the wood is moved and it jams. This one still turns all the way around, so that's good. But uh, that, it's, it's contrary. I mean, Mike wants to make, will want to make a nice tight fit and then thread it. I want to make a fit that's loose enough so it never, never gets caught. So the magnet does all the work. How much, how much air space can you have before a magnet doesn't hang anymore? Do you depends know on, that? With... Depends on the strength of the magnet, totally. Okay. Okay. Uh, but at a sixteenth of an inch, it seems to not be a problem. By the time you get out to a quarter, it's diminished significantly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in fact, there are charts that show that for magnets on the magnet site that I use, and that's K, K and J Magnetics here in Pennsylvania. Uh, they have a lot of graphs that show how magnets interrelate and how the, the shape of the field and how rapidly it falls off and, the, and all that stuff. It's very interesting stuff that you can barely understand, but the information's out there. Anybody else? Uh, I, I guess my comment is I think the important thing is is when you're making a, a container uh, with a lid on it, you've got to think about what it is you're trying to accomplish and, and what the purpose is. Clearly, in, in the situation you're describing where you uh, want a multi-stack box for sandpaper, magnets are the solution. Uh, I made a box to hold some Forstner bits and, uh, for traveling to put my work, uh, throw in my toolbox. It has a very long piston lid, which which holds it very fairly snugly, but kind of loosely because of that piston effect. When you pull it, it, it creates kind of a suction. So it stays on pretty good. Similar to a pill box that you put in your pocket that has a long piston. Now, they, well, thread, uh, chefware kits, came up with a threading jig solution that, that I thought was kind of strange. And they sent me a sample that had a bayonet, a threaded bayonet lid. And so you had four channels. So the, the, the thing would come together and then lock in less than a quarter of a turn. And I looked at it, showed it to a couple of other folks that did threads. And they said, yeah, that's kind of interesting, but who wants to, no one would pay for that extra work it looks a little strange and what does it accomplish well uh craig at chefware kits uh, disregarded the feedback and he went ahead and, and had this thing machined and sold it and he sold very few copies because everybody i think came to the same conclusion it's like it was a lot of extra work to index this you had to you had a two a two start thread so you know and then you get to the ladies that want a, a single lift you know, loose lit where they can pull it off with one hand versus a pill box that you want to have two hands. So I think you've got to think about what are you you're trying to accomplish with that particular box and then design the, the, the mechanism or, or the, the fit appropriately. I think that's right. And uh, my goal here, what I'm after with these really is a box that will stay closed in my pocket. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, Due to circumstances I don't need to explain, I, I, I have a bunch of meds I need to take throughout the day. I need to have a way of carrying them with me in my pocket so I can't, uh, I can't lose them, they can't come open. Um, and similarly, the ways to, to check boxes with things like meds and them into a suitcase or a briefcase and have it stay closed. So that's my goal with it mm -hmm. and be easy to open but be secure when it's shut. So yeah, but Mike is absolutely right. You got to know what it is you're trying to do to make it work well. And John, that, the other interesting thing would be to make like four little pockets in the, in when you twist open, you have four sections, but you'd have to route out those little cavities, I guess. No, you could do it by uh, making little bridge pieces. Uh, 
getting little veins across. I've done that a bunch. That works or, pretty well. Too. Or uh, drill, I, or drill a series of holes. Drill yeah. a series of holes with a Forstner bit, so you'll have maybe five compartments. And then you can have a hole in the lid, and then you can rotate on magnets. <laughs> yeah. And build the one you there you want. go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So lots of lots of design work there. If you ever get it to work in the first place, John, you you, you mentioned uh, the strength of the magnets. Is there a, a, a like a, a standard uh, like like if you order? You said you went to A and J Magnetics. If if you wanted something, say for example, like with your pills, there is there you say I want a nine or a ten or a twelve or something. Is there a way to gauge that, or how do you how do you know how strong it's going to be when you buy it? Well, there's there's two levels of neodymium magnets, N42 and N52, I think they're designated. One's a bit stronger than the other, but it really depends on the size of the magnet, the volume of the magnet. Uh, that has everything to do with it. Uh, and when you get very a little way into this, you find yourself with a lot of magnets of a lot of different sizes, and you get an intuitive sense of, of it, but there's it's very hard to measure. It's not measurable by us. us. And the measurements you get, like the pull against the, the fixed plate, aren't, aren't quite relevant either. So you just have to get a feel for it. But in general, the bigger the magnet, the stronger the pull. So if you don't have enough pull, you got to find a way to put either a magnet that's more bigger diameter or longer or both. It, but they make issue. them every yeah. size you want, every it's, imaginable size. It, it's the issue you have with you, these cheap refrigerator magnets that will barely hold one sheet of paper. Uh, whereas if you're going to make some magnets, you do want to make sure that you've got a, a rare earth magnet of the appropriate size and strength where it'll hold at least two sheets of paper. Yeah. You can also get, I have some bar magnets that are, oh, they're maybe two inches by uh, half an inch by three eighths of an inch. I can't get them apart by hand. I have to drive a, a, a steel blade in there to separate them. Uh, they are the strength, the amount of holding power you can get out of these magnets, the contemporary new, rare earth magnets is astonishing. By the time the magnet gets to be the size of your thumb, it's as strong as you are. John, good, maybe you, you could tell us what sizes you found effective for you. That I, use a lot of, I use a lot of 3 16 by 3 16 cylinders, uh, a quarter by a quarter cylinders. Uh, a quarter by three sixteen stick cylinders. I found one eighth is too small to have much grab and one half diameter is too big. So I'm pretty much staying with the quarter inch and the three sixteenths inch diameter in lengths that range from an eighth. I have some up to, I think I have some half inch ones. And to make Doug's box, I'm gonna get some five eighths ones. Harbor Freight has a uh, set of magnets for about $3. I think they're a quarter inch there are about 10 magnets in it, so it's they're easy to find. Uh, don't have to pay shipping uh, if, if you got a local Harbor Freight. And they, they're a good strength for a refrigerator magnet. Yes, yes. Uh, K&J is the outfit I use. Uh, they do charge freight. But, you know, the other thing is you, you don't get very far in this. I mean, this box here has uh, mm -hmm. 6, 12, 16 magnets. Mm -hmm. They cost about 50 cents each. So you, you, it doesn't take very long to be using magnets in the double digit numbers. Yeah, and you're hey, using John, seat. I was thinking um, if you were to uh, look for a source of magnets, there's one place called American Scientific Surplus. I know that. They're, uh, just, yeah, okay. And uh, the other one was, uh, there's, a, there's a place straight out of China called FEMU. And I just stumbled across them, but they have some incredible prices. And they're well thought of. They use PayPal and everything like that. Uh, the other thing is when you're trying to gauge the strength of a magnet, the larger ones, they talk about so many Tesla. Um, the smaller ones, they ought to tell you how many pounds or ounces that they'll lift. Sometimes when you get the big ones, they'll say a 50 pound or whatever. But uh, they'll set, if you have to read the print, because sometimes they're lifting something out of water and um, it's not quite the same. It's buoyed just a little bit, even though it's steel. Uh, Going to say something else, but I lost it. So, so the they, oh, I use, I, I've looked at all those sites. The reason I use K&J is they're here in Pennsylvania. And if I order today, I'll get them tomorrow or the next day, which I kind of like. So. Yeah, K&J, I've got to investigate those people. The other thing is it's a distance squared function as far as the strength of the magnets, like a light bulb, you know, you, right. you have the distance where you quarter the, you, you got it. 
Okay, guys, thanks. You square the distance all the way for those of you who ever took physics. Yeah. And you're CA gluing them in, right, John? Yes, I do. Yeah, I already box it. Usually CA. What was that source of magnets from China? F E F U? No, it was F E M U. F E M U. They have, it, you'll spend hours going through their catalog. They have some good stuff. And they, like I say, it's the people that I know that have worked with them spoke highly of them, but it's straight out of China. There's no middleman. Now, you guys who are here with your hands up, anybody else want to talk on this or should we go to you for other topics? Uh, Tatkowski, you're on this one. Go ahead. Okay. Gotcha. We're good. What I have here are uh, salt boxes. I made a couple years ago and I have the uh, lid. You can see it. You have a pin and you have, you have two magnets, one in the top and one in the base. These are thick, like you were saying, but the, the idea is for a salt box on a, on a, a, for a cook, you know, they're easy to use. The lid actually kind of indexes back, you know, when it's rotated back to cover the salt. And uh, these are, uh, how do you say, easy to make. The grain, the grain uh, is, followed you know real close that's uh, a nice design bill that's a very nice design thank you well and here's another little one out of cherry that i put um let's see if you can see i inlaid it inlaid some uh, brass to to kind of uh mm. decorate it a little bit but but these uh they all rotate, they index rather easy. You won't lose the top, you know, on the uh, cook, when the cook is cooking, the, the top stays with it. Um, basically, that, that's what I have to show you quick. But How does the pin work so it doesn't come out? You know, I'm trying to think about how I did that. <laughs> I, I can't tell you. It, it is, it is uh, fixed in there. I can't, yeah, it, it's, it's a tight fit. It, it must be some type of a shaft, a nail or something, but it's a tight fit. It, it really, okay, to push it on. Wow, okay. So you'll now have to it's take going. it apart by the snow when you figure it out. Yeah, well, I, th I think it's just a tight fit, but but it, it, it uh, I guess for the amount that you use it, eventually it could be a problem, I guess, but it seems to index and hold with the uh, magnets. The magnets are- I, I know, like that part. I'm gonna try that, something like that. And I'm also gonna go to Landers next, who's got something on this same point. Oh, yeah, thank you guys. <clears throat> All right, there we go. <laughs> um, yeah, so just another thing you can do with magnets. I made, uh, I've made a couple of uh, hot air balloons. <laughs> so, and that floats, floats on there. So there's a, there's a magnet in the, this is just a hollow form. There is a tube, a brass tube running through the middle. And, um, <clears throat> and there's a magnet in the basket and another magnet down in the base. And they are opposing, so the thing floats on the very clever on the magnet. Very clever. You guys are so clever. That's great. So magnets are fun. <laughs> you got Dave, any more? The, Dave, the top part is floating, spinning separately from the middle black. What's that about? Oh well, the there is a uh, ah. a tube that's holding the two together. So, and then the, the, the magnet is down in the bottom of the basket and the tube runs all the way through. Oh, but it's not like centered. That. It's not centered. Well, yeah, it just kind of, it's, it, it kind of just did that because the only thing that's holding that is some epoxy in the base and a little bit of epoxy uh, around the, where it goes through the top. So yeah, it's kind of hard to get that all the way center. I kind of like the fact that it's a little uh, 
yeah. that it, it kind of does a little uh, Hawaiian dance thing, I guess. So. Would you do that again, Dave? I want to see your Hawaiian dance. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, no, you don't. <laughs> that is very clever. And those, those magnets are, they're just, um, well, let me get back over here. They're the, um, you know, donut shaped magnets. And like the other guys are saying, um, you know, a couple of the good websites out there. I happen to go to a company called Total Element, but it really doesn't matter. Um, you know, you can find, you know, the strength of the magnet by like pounds or grams or ounces or whatever. And the other thing that I do is when I make these pieces, <clears throat> um, I'll take the, let's see, what do I do? I put the pieces on like a balance scale to see you know, how heavy they are. And then I kind of use the magnet to try and push the balance scale one way or the other to make sure that the magnets I've got are going to float this. So I'll put this together. Let's see, what do I, yeah, I'll put this together, put it on the scale and then kind of use a, a magnet on the other side of the balance scale to make sure that I can, uh, that I can push that. Because if I get this hollow form here too heavy, it'll just, it'll just float sit right down on the base. I'm not explaining that very well, but I yeah, kind of use the the balance scale uh, with the pieces all disassembled to make sure I've got the right weight of magnets in there. So you're making the hollow form in order to lighten the load. You could also increase the strength of the magnet to the same effect, couldn't you? Could, but but I think, you know, if you had a, a good dense wood up here, well, I think it's a better effect to, um, to be able to look in there and see that, you know, as a hollow form. I started making these because I made a hollow form and I blew out the, um, you know, I made a hollow form with a, with a, uh, that was kind of shaped like, like that. And I blew out the bottom and I started looking at it thinking, oh, what could I do with that? I mean, I never did anything with that piece, but that, that mistake got me to kind of, you know, evolve and, and think about, well, that kind of looks like a balloon. And then I kind of ended up with the, with this, I don't know where the magnets came from in my brain, but anyway. What is that wood? What is that wood? Uh, this is uh, beetle kill pine, and the basket is black palm. Okay. Which, if you want a horrible, horrible wood to turn that splinters and um, you know gets in your fingers and and chips out really bad, black palms are good. <laughs> <laughs> Is, is that rod met, uh, steel or brass? Brass. Does that matter? So the uh, brass is not magnetic. So the so the brass doesn't uh, you know the doesn't affect the magnetism, if you will. Um, and also, I've I've turned a little um, finial on the top of this. It's an eighth inch brass rod. There's a teeny little finial on the top that I've turned. We've talked about turning brass um, a couple yeah. of times in this thing. So, um, and brass is soft enough that you can get away with doing stuff like that. So just a little brass tube and a brass rod that goes in the middle that I got at the hardware store. So very nice. Anybody else on this? Before I go to the, some other guys and other things. Okay. Enough magnets for today then. Thank you very much. That's very helpful to me. Um, who, who's over here anyway? Is that Bert up top there? Yeah, Bert. Yeah, right okay. Up, you know. Okay. Well, I just uh, had a friend ask me if I could make a wooden curling rock. So I made a wooden curling rock. This is solid wood, maple, walnut, and I had to put a. Uh, Why do you want a wooden curling rock? Uh, they want it as a trophy for their uh, 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 for their club or whatever. They're they're wanting to. Uh, uh, Why wouldn't they uh, just, just use a real curling rock? Uh, because it's way heavier. Like uh, the curling rock's really heavy, and they wanted something they could use as a as a trophy. So, so I made this one it's solid. But then when I looked at the uh, the shape, I started thinking I make a lot of urns, and we were talking about threading a little bit uh, a minute ago. So uh, I took the same idea and I made an insert that's threaded. 
and it holds, uh, this is an actual uh, uh, salvaged uh, curling rock handle. Uh, there's a company up here that reserve or uh, reconditions curling rocks, and these are old handles, goosenecks. So I bought a couple of those, and I hollowed out this uh, curling rock shape. And uh, come to find out, this particular one is about 165 uh, cubic inches, and it's a little smaller than an official uh, curling rock. But I made another one that I've got in the shop right now. I haven't uh, haven't quite completely finished it, and. It's 235 cubic inches. Uh, it's a regular size curling rock made out of wood, but it's hollow. So are you going to so, sell these or give these to curlers for their own ashes? Well, uh, the, the person that asked for these wanted this one solid wood for a trophy for their club. They're in Calgary and they wanted something unique and different. So they wanted a curling rock for a trophy for the year end uh, celebration or whatever. So I made that one. <clears throat> but when I made that one, I, I thought, Hey, this is a perfect shape for an urn for the uh, people that are hardcore curlers. And uh, I just thought I'd try it just because. I mean, uh, you've well, got to try and do something, even if it's wrong. But I had to use threading, and I had to, you know, there's a lot of uh, uh, technique in figuring out how to hold it. What I mean, Bert, is have any of the hardcore curlers come along and acquired one for their own ashes? Well, I had somebody come and ask me to make a basketball. So I made a basketball urn. <laughs> but nobody's got a curling ar a rock urn yet. Not yet, no. Uh, but uh, the, the, pe the, the lady that asked for this one, when she's seen this one, said she's going to take it because she has a friend that may like it. And it's called forward planning. We're all, we all know, we're all members of the human race. We know where the end of the race is. We're just, uh, some of us run faster than others. Well, I guess really the yeah. question is whether anybody actually wants to be memorialized inside a curling rock. <laughs> well, it just makes it easier to drop in the hole. <laughs> or throw down the track. <laughs> yeah. Well, one of the things that my next one is going to be a golf ball. I'm going to make a golf ball the same shape as uh, uh, the basketball one I made. and uh, But I'm going to make it in a, as a golf ball. So then they, when they get a hole in one, that might be the only hole in one that they'll ever get. <laughs> first of all i can vouch for the golf ball story with the hole in one because i've only ever got yeah. one and i'm a, I'm a really really bad golfer just to demonstrate how lucky i am but i also wanted to comment to john if you if you don't think there's some canadians that want to be buried in a cur curling rock obviously you're not canadian anymore john is all like <laughs> your heritage completely I know they're out there. I just wondered if Bert happened to actually knew know of any, and whether it was catching is what I was going to ask next. You know, <laughs> well, it's, it's one of those things when uh, when when you make one and the first person sees one, then uh, the phone starts to ring or the email starts to go crazy because uh, that's that's usually what I found is you you make one, it gets out there, and they tell two friends, and they tell two friends. Pretty soon, you got people phoning you and emailing you, wanting to it turns into a job. So it's I, kind of fun. Well, I know oh, you made a, you made a bunch of curling urns, Bert. But I wonder, in the group in general, though, I mean, funeral urns. Do other people make funeral urns, crematorium urns? Can I have a little show of hands? How popular is this among the thing that people do? I see only two or three on here. Uh, well, I one John, if I could just talk to that. Unless you're going after a specialty item like we're talking about, I try to do and cut in the market with this around here with the various. Um, with the various uh, funeral homes. And the problem is, is they can get a huge number of urns from all over the world for very, very cheap. And a guy can go into a catalog and have 45 or 50 urns sitting there on in his funeral home without any effort. So to actually get somebody, um, a, a craftsman doing it, you got to find a different way of getting rid of like a, a, what you're saying with those um, curling rocks or something along that line. I, I've made them for myself and my wife after I saw Gawkenauer. Gawkenauer made a pair for himself and his wife, and I know that Angelo did that too. I guess I'm wondering how much of a custom that is among woodturners. How many of you guys are making urns or have made or want to make urns for yourself and your wife? Not a lot well, I've, of got, uh, I've got two urns for ourselves, and I've had uh, my wife's uh, aunt and uncle ask me to make urns, so I have urns uh, for them. Uh, this is the basketball urn. It looks like a basketball on a little base, and it's got a threaded opening on the bottom, so they can fill the urn. I think uh, 
This one, I think, is 250 cubic inches. It's amazing how much uh, how much volume you get in a in a round shape like this. It's it's amazing how much volume they they hold. But uh, threading, I've got that uh, Chefware kit threading jig, and I thread lots and lots of things now. And I've I've found the optimum size for these entry holes is I drill a hole uh, two and fifteen sixteenths, then I make, then I make the plug make the plug to fit, and that seems to be uh, optimal. But without a jig, without a threading jig, I'd never be able to do it. <laughs> what do you got there, Mike? Uh, I've got a. I've made several several urns. I made one for me for advanced forward planning, and unfortunately, my had a family member that needed it before I did. Here's one where uh, I made one out of uh, PV a PVC fitting, so you don't need a threading jig, uh, and it's a good it's a good size. Uh, one of my viewers sent me this beautiful piece of uh, dried sycamore and the top is is actually uh, white oak. Uh, there was a fellow that did a presentation for our club some years back. Uh, I think it's artistic urns, I think his name of his company He does a lot of pet urns, but he does a lot of human uh, cremation urns as well, and he did a, a fascinating demonstration for the club not how to make one but really talking about urns and the funeral industry how he may how he does it in a production fashion because he runs a uh a, a business where he's got five six seven employees and so he's he had all these production techniques for drilling processing uh kill drying that was just amazing uh he he used white oak because you could ebonize it and see the prominent grain and it was easily to uh, easy to get white oak from your uh, uh, lumber yard. He tried more expensive exotic woods. He said the customers didn't like them because they looked too much like plastic. So he went with white oak, uh, such as this one. And then I did another one that it was a simple urn in that it was a two part urn. You know, you could do it with a, you know, bowl gouge with with the beads, you know, trying to conceal the join. Uh, and this is one where I actually used a threading threading jig for both parts. Hey, Mike. Yep. What kind of uh, plastic fitting did you use there? For I that can't tell jig? you exactly what it was, except it was a common PVC fitting I got at Home Depot. Now, somebody did an article a while back. If you can get ABS fittings, they're the best because they're black. So aesthetically, they look a little nicer. But I think you've got to go to a plumbing supply place to find those around here. Uh, if you go to the, your big box home development store, such as Lowe's or Home Depot, all you can get is is the uh, uh, white PVC. But you. Figure out what's about what size or go to the store and look and you'll find those two parts. I, I don't whether you call it a coupling or or what, but the, the parts were fairly inexpensive. And of course, you have to cut it, you know, cut them down to, to fit. The thing you have to watch out for is the the um, the fittings that you get to like join two pieces of pipe together, screw two pieces of pipe together are usually tapered uh, like the pipe thread is normally tapered. And so the ones you want that work better, I found, are the um, straight, like on the tailpipe of uh, from under a sink, because those are clean out. Shredded. She has a, a clean yeah, out. The clean out, the clean out, clean out caps. Works. Yeah. So just so, watch it that you don't get something tapered that then you have to fiddle with the threads anyway. So. <laughs> We're so like Mike, if you, uh, all we have is ABS. Mike, have you ever used the brass fittings? Brass fittings are quite expensive, uh, even if you buy the drain. You know, uh, I, I'm trying to remember who sells them. Those companies kind of come and go for selling the brass fittings uh, in, for the wood turning community, but uh, someone is making them. It might be Ron, Ron Brown. I've seen them made out of uh, some kind of floor drain, but even that can be quite expensive. I just prefer the wood because you know I thread. That's what I do. So, uh, this is John. I think uh, stainless steel stoppers 
uh, if you look on their website, I think they're making a whole series of um, yes. threaded inserts in brass. Yeah, Carl Jacobs, when he took over, yeah, Ruth and Oz, you're right. That's the source I was thinking of. They just they just started coming out with those, but they're 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 fairly pricey. That's the site called Stainless Steel Stoppers. They make wine stopper hardware. Is that right? Uh, no, that's a that's the competitor. It's uh, I think it's uh, it's it's Niles. I think it's Niles bottle stoppers or Niles stainless steel. The other one, the other company, the stainless steel was one that used to fabricate the parts for uh, Ruth. If I got this story right, and then she didn't copyright it. Next thing you know, they were selling them and 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 lowering the price and competing with her. Uh, she she had some real legal issues with that. We could stay out of that. Anybody else on this topic? Yeah, uh, Bert, where do you get those handles? Those, I like those handles for other uses. Where, okay, where can uh, I acquire those handles? I, I searched and searched and searched and finally found a company in um, uh, Winnipeg, Winnipeg, uh, Manitoba. And um, I'm trying to remember the name of the, the company, but I, I, I searched. Uh, uh, for curling, curling rock repair, I think is what I've used. And um, they actually recertify curling rocks as stone. And they put the modern technology with all the electronics and stuff on it. And, and they, they have all of these old handles and they just resell them. So I'll, I'll see if I can find it here and uh, I'll put it in the chat. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, gonna I've move got, on. I'm gonna move on to- I've got uh, one here, John. Oh, it's okay. Uh, this is uh, the one I made for my partner, and uh, it's done with an ABS thread, uh, as you can see, with an e ebonized uh, insert there, and uh, th they work pretty good. I've done about uh, 10 to 12 uh, customers already. Where is that? Where are you, Don? Well, I'm in Ontario near uh, Welland. Okay. We got guys from all over the place. I have no idea where you guys are from anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else on this? That's the black ABS you're talking about, Don. Is that right? Yes, I use the black ABS. We can get it here at our local uh, home hardware. Okay. Uh, we have we have the choice of the black or the white, so. We only I always ever, get the black. We only ever see white, but I guess the wholesalers probably have it. Um, anybody else on this? Okay. I want to go to Toby. You got your hand up there, Toby. What are you going to show us today? Well, I have two things. First one is a little self-promotion. I have a, an article in the local Harrisburg magazine, and I just posted a link to it on the chat there. That's okay. the first thing. Okay. And the second is over the Christmas holiday between, hold on, I messed up here. Can't find myself, here we go. Between uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas, our local art group, the uh, chapter of the Pennsylvania Guild of Craftsmen rented a store in the mall in uh, Sealands Grove. And 10 of us got together and we split the cost of the rental and we set up our stuff there and we sold things on the weekends where we get the most shoppers. Weekdays, shopping shoppers pretty uh, light. So anyway, it worked out really well for, uh, for us and me in particular. Well, what do you mean pretty well? Uh, how many weekends were you open? Uh, five, I think. And you had you rented the store space for that space. So, what was your investment in the store? The total investment for the store was uh, fifteen hundred and eighty dollars, and we split it ten ways. So it was one hundred and fifty-eight dollars for me. And, and how many pieces do you think you sold in those five weeks? Oh, I didn't count the pieces, but I, the the uh, total sales for me was uh, thirty-seven hundred and fifty dollars, or something like that. So five or six hundred dollars per weekend, roughly. 
That sounds about right. Yeah. And we, and we also we also split the uh, staffing of the store amongst the ten of us. Well, that was like taking turns. Right. Right. Would you do that again? This was actually our third year, so yeah. And, and what mall did you do that in, and how did the others do? Uh, it's the Susquehanna Valley Mall in Sealands Grove, and I, I did the best. Uh, I think there were four other people that did uh, about fifteen hundred dollars, and the rest were slightly under that thousand dollars or so. What did you do for store fixtures and how much inventory was in there at any given time and signage and promo? What did you do to make this work? We, we put our banners up of our local chapter and then uh, made up some handmade uh, signs and posters for advertising. Like we put them up ahead of time, like we're going to open because the store had been vacant for the whole previous year. And what did you do? Then, fixtures and counters or tables. What did you do? Yeah, we we just went around and the, the mall was real good about it. We went around to the other vacant stores and just scavenged whatever we we wanted and moved it into this store. Plus, I used some of my own uh, my own racks and shelves. So, what's your guess of how much went how much volume that store did in those five weeks, either in dollars or total, not just you. We did about twelve thousand dollars in those, that that amount of time. Okay. Anybody else have any experience like that? Questions for Toby or comments or other experiences like this? I think it's very interesting that you could make uh, that work in that short, you know, like a pop up store, right. handle off your year's inventory of wood turnings and done. Yeah, and this is this was uh like I say this was our third year, and uh, we've had many pre our repeat customers, and they're really glad that our store was there because we had nice things, and handmade stuff. Everything's handmade and local artists, so that's a draw for the. Toby, how did they advertise the event? Uh, it, there was a, mostly left up to us. They did some promotion on uh, Facebook, the mall itself. With the rest of it was, you know, the 10 of us just advertising on our social media and, you know. Was, uh, was it yeah, all wood turning or would you have some carving and then little bits of furniture and things? Well, no, I was the only wood turner. We had, we had uh, I think, four jewelers. We had a potter. We had uh, press flower pictures. We had a uh, uh, frock tour, which is uh, Pennsylvania Dutch uh, writing. Uh, Fiber. Some so had fiber, whole, fiber artists. So you we had, had a whole range of craft stuff there. For people right. So we get, you know, people come in for all that stuff. And once they come in, then they can see stuff that they didn't actually come in for and and buy that also. Toby, uh, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I've done cooperative art shows, but we all have the same product. And then it becomes a battle of who's the cheapest, and then everybody buys that. And if I was a high end one, I couldn't sell because they go, I'll go over and buy his for 20 bucks. The, the customer doesn't appreciate the subtle difference, I guess. So the fact that you're diversified in crafts was probably part of your secret of working for you. Get people in and you don't have competitive choices. Yeah, I think that's right. Jewelry course, you know, in any show, jewelry has a, you know, there's lots of them. And there was a little bit of that going on, you know, price-wise with them. But they, what they did was actually quite different. So it wasn't too much competition. Well, Toby, I, I, I'd be curious, uh, did, were your sales appreciably higher when you were working? Yes, that does make a difference because people would come in and I would talk to people. And even when... Uh -huh. Other people were there and staffing the store. Yeah. Their sales were up also. Yeah. Because people want to hear the story behind the piece, you know, yeah. where you live, how'd you make it, how'd you get started. Then when they buy the piece, they have something that, you know, I'm memorable about it. What I recollect from when my brother was in the business of making wood things, he would, he would go to the Ottawa Crafts Fair year after year with furniture and expensive things. And then he figured out that he could make little kaleidoscopes and little mirrors that he could sell back in the day for under 10 bucks, today for under 20 bucks. He would take a couple of suitcases full of that stuff, sell out, 
and make more money at the, off the show than he'd ever made with it larger work because he was the only craftsperson in the whole place who had items under 10 bucks. So I don't yeah. know that that does not strike me as a as a way to fame and fortune. That strikes me as a race to the bottom. But nevertheless, <laughs> and, now, I, and I have an I have a line of uh, lower priced items, but my lower price are like twenty to thirty five to fifty dollars, and then I have my bigger pieces, you know, that are between one hundred and two hundred dollars. But uh, I I when I was done, my shelves were. <laughs> Well depleted. You got rid they, of they bought a variety of things. Yeah. Oh, yeah. John, this sounds like a great topic for you to schedule maybe September, October of next year or this year rather, uh, and, and try to find one or two people, you know, with a lot of sales and craft show experience to kind of talk about this whole area. Yeah. It's an interesting area. It's, to me, it's a contradiction. I don't want to sell things. I, I, if I get into the business of selling things, I'll hate, uh, I'll come to hate making them. Uh, I, you know, I used to love to write. I used to think I was a poet. And then I became a journalist and an editor, and I write only for money. I don't do it for fun. And I don't want that to happen in my woodworking hobby. Uh, and so I'm kind of, you know, it's, a, it's one of those topics that it's, it's interesting, it's valuable to a lot of people, but it's also could be poisonous to people like me. Yeah, I, I understand that. And then I, I have the same thought process. You know, I retired. I don't want another job. But what I do is I make the things that I like to make, not what people want me to make. So I'm just doing my hobby. And then I have to get rid of these things. I make hundreds of, you know, every year. So I do craft shows also, along with this store. Well, that's what I'm running into too. I, I give stuff away, but I'm kind of sitting with a surplus of stuff right now. Uh, <laughs> on the other hand, you know, if my wife and I go traveling this winter and visit people all throughout the South, we got hostess gifts up the nose. We'll be able to leave everybody with a very nice return. <laughs> but after a while, you know, you'll go back and see the same people. And say, hey, we already got one of those. Oh, we got two of those. How many of those do we need? <laughs> I have a spreadsheet, John. I started when I first started turning for my gifts. I have I have a, a sheet for family and a sheet for everybody else in the same spreadsheet and I can filter on their name and see exactly what I gave them and when and why so I don't I don't duplicate I know now, now, me, it just works for me I'm gonna go on my crystal ball here for a second and your career when you were working Mike I'll bet you were an accountant uh, I would say I finished my career as a as a bi uh, business analyst doing software implementation. <laughs> <laughs> I love the idea of the spreadsheet. Great. It's a good idea. You got your hand up, John. What do you want to show us? Chalikian. Um, I wanted to, uh, from the discussion last week and all the help that uh, people got, um, I got from from folks input on the Grizzly, I went ahead and ordered uh, the next day, I ordered the, um, the Grizzly 22 by 42 late. So uh, thank you very much for everybody's input. I really appreciate it, it made all the difference. And now I have a, uh, a Delta lathe to sell. So if anybody's interested, <laughs> let What's me know. What's the spec on the Delta? Um, it's a 12 inch uh, by uh, 36 inch. It's basic, it's, uh, I've reconditioned it, uh, new bearings, belts, a uh, lot of loving, tender care. So it operates real well, three quarter horsepower motor. What's the spindle? Uh, one by eight, one, by one eight. inch by ATP. I. Not to be too fine a point on it, but would you consider donating it to the club? Um, if I can't sell it, yes. Okay. Uh, we got five minutes left. Anybody else? So somebody's got a hand up there. Who's that? Doug, what do you got to show? Well, I don't have anything to show, but I just wanted to comment that uh, Jim Bowman uh, yesterday or the day before sent me an article from, what was it, um, the Collingwood or Owen Sound, whatever, that I thought was an interesting one. You should post it on the website, on the site of here, if you haven't already done it, John. It was for the, um, the Jim, it was for the, funeral, um, the obituary of... Uh, Stephen Hogman. Stephen Hogman, but it gave a shout out, John, to your um, coffee hour as a place is, it actually mentioned John Kelsey's coffee hour. 
<laughs> it was the it was the last paragraph, and I went. Yeah. I want to say it. I went and watched it again. That was yeah. a wonderful sixteen minute tribute you did to him, John. I just, I would. It was worth watching again. So thank you. We, we also have the we did the one hour program of uh, with various people speaking. That's also available out there someplace on uh, on my I guess on my site in the Coffee Hour archive. Uh, they yeah, uh, they would... they took that sixteen minute thing where I read his essay against the slides. They played it at the <laughs> memorial they had in Owen Sound last fall. Wow. Uh, they okay. invited me to come up and read it. I didn't want to make the trip, so they just took the recording. Okay, well that's what they referred to. I just thought it was interesting to see your name and lights john as opposed to obituaries <laughs> yeah. well i'm glad to hear that but we're not ready for the obituary yet <laughs> anybody else today I, I i got something if you're looking go for, for it. it go for it we got a couple minutes here um i'm always amazed when i start with a big chunk of wood why end up with small ones Maybe it's because I'm not buying perfect wood or whatever, but I had air dried this in my cabinet as a 16 or yeah, not a 16, maybe a 12 inch blank. And it developed a huge crack. This is London plain, uh, beautiful grain. Uh, sorry about the junk in the middle, but it gave me a chance to do square turning again. I used to turn square feet a lot for platters and stuff sometimes because of necessity funnelizing it and then filling it with that uh and attaching the foot um just just had fun with that this week uh london plane is just i'm gonna try to get some more from the guys that i got this it came from barnes arboretum it's supposed to be all pretty much like the same as maple is it how is it compared to maple uh, I think it's more colorful. Um, it's, yeah, I, I think I think it's got more color and the green swirls more in my book. It's, I don't think it cuts like hard maple. It's probably more like the soft maples to cut. Um, okay. Yeah, it's, it's a beautiful wood. I'm, I'm so pleased I'm part of the Delaware Club. They have a connection with the Barnes Arboretum and now that, that a lot of those trees are 100 years old, plus because they started our arboretum in the early 1900s, they're starting to take down trees. So I, I, I have a piece on the lathe right now. It's Japanese lilac. Does anybody know about it? It, it has a, a pungent taste to it when you're turning it, taste or smell. It almost feels like it's poisonous. So I didn't know if anybody has ever turned Japanese lilac or not so I never have you know it came from the Barnes Arboretum so Randy. I have a lot of lilac in my yard and I uh I turn it a lot for small things especially for like mushrooms and things like that and I just love the smell of it when I'm when I'm turning it and it's a really nice purplish pink when it starts out it's a uh, really quite a, quite a unique wood does it stay that way uh, absolutely not, but I don't. I haven't had one turn, but I know that eventually it's going to turn brown. Yeah. Uh, Randy, you got your What's hand up there. The last word for us about the farm show, I bet you. Yes. Uh, of course, next week is the local Pennsylvania farm show, and uh, we will be demonstrating wood turning at the uh, in the main hall near the um, butter sculpture. Uh, we have a giant butter sculpture, weighs a thousand pounds worth of butter. And uh, <laughs> this is a farm show. You'll have to take my word on this, tractor square dancing, which is just exactly what it sounds like. <laughs> People riding tractors and square dancing. <laughs> but anyway, anyone who's, who's in the area and you're going by the farm show, Stop by. And all, and all I can say is, you Amer Americans complain or laugh at Canadians for uh, urns made out of uh, made out of um, curling uh, stones. And down <laughs> in the chat, you'll you'll find Bert's source for those handles. Those are available. Uh, oh. And uh, since it's next week, on our on our uh, uh, during our thing, 
I may drop in during the coffee. Okay, that'd be great. Yeah, I'll be uh, doing coffee from New York next week, but we'll be happy to have you drop in from the farm show. Okay. Uh, Bruce, you got a last word here? Yeah, I can't compete with the butter statue, but um, <laughs> th this weekend is the wood turning show in, uh, or next to the woodworking show in Baltimore uh, at the State Fairgrounds in Timonium. If anyone's interested, our club will be demonstrating uh, all weekend, uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And uh, it's the first time it's been held, uh, I guess, in three years uh, due to COVID. So uh, welcome back. <laughs> That's in Timonium, is that right? That's correct. That's actually closer to Lancaster than Philadelphia is, actually. <laughs> the Cow Palace at the State Fairgrounds. <laughs> <laughs> when did you say that was? Uh, this oh, Friday, God. Saturday, and Sunday. You can find it, I believe, if you look up The Wood Turning Show uh, Baltimore on the web, you'll find it. Okay. Peter says he's going to go, too. So I'll be there Saturday. I'll be there on Saturday. And on that note, kids, you've, uh, we've whiled away another very pleasant hour. Um, we'll see you all again next week. Um, same channel. Yeah, thanks, care. John. Thanks, yeah. all. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Wood shop. Thank God for wood.